Well, we have a little bit of a challenge there, a little technical difficulties. I apologize. My name is Jeff Harrison with uh, the Mortgage Works, and this is Mortgage Minute. It's Thursday. It must be around two o'clock in the afternoon. And you know what? It has been a volatile week. There's been a lot going on. Not all of this bad news. And there's a little bit of, uh, you know, it's like salt and pepper. But when you put them together, they really make life entertaining. And it makes uh, things that we eat a little bit more palatable. So, we're going to order in from the chef himself. Let's bring in Art from Mortgage Work. Hello, <laughs> Chef Art. Uh, hi, Jeff. How are you doing? I forgot my chef's hat. <laughs> uh oh, I was expecting, but you but you are wearing an apron, right? Well, maybe. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll ask for you to do some knife skills at the end of the program today, just yeah, to show right. us how to slice them up. Oh, okay, sure. So a lot's been going on, huh? You got a lot, a lot to share with us today. Yeah, I think so. It's been a very interesting week in the bond markets. And your uh, term there you just used, I think, is quite appropriate volatility. And it's uh, the bond yields of the 10 year bond has really been jumping around, particularly today. In fact, it's mm -hmm. uh, really, really been volatile today. So we'll kind of get into that and what's going on and why that's occurring. Um, I, I wouldn't panic too much, but it certainly is going to um, reflect the fact that, you know, rates, mortgage rates are trended up a little bit this week. So. <clears throat> Well, let's uh, let's get into it. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, before yeah. I let you go, I just want to point out that if you are joining us live and you have a question about anything that Art is talking about, or maybe you have a question specifically that you'd like an answer to, just put it in the chat. I'll be hanging out there for you and I'll send it over to Art and he can address that. If you are joining us after the, the fact and you didn't get to join us at the live party, well, please put your comments or questions in the chat, whether you're in Facebook or YouTube. And Art is the master at getting back to those and uh, we'll fill you in. So Art, with that, I'm going to step away. Let's have a great show. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, this week's Mortgage Minute. I'm, I'm Art Alvarez with Mortgage Works, where, of course, we have the answers and they're on the house. And as you know, if you've been a viewer uh, on a regular basis, you know that I'd like to start with uh, the show every week talking about where are mortgage rates. So I want to give you a mortgage rate update. Uh, this is our current rate grid. Uh, you can see it on our website. And this is reflecting what's going on in terms of mortgage rates right now. Um, and of course, when you look at this, uh, if you go to our site and look at the uh, rate chart, you can get a pretty good idea that we're definitely well into the sixes, even getting into the higher sixes. And, and as I pointed out more than once, if you want to get a better idea of how mortgage rates even uh, come to be, you just look at the about mortgage rates tab at the bottom of that page. And I go into more detail about how mortgage rates are set. So as to where we're at on mortgage rates, what's going on this week that has uh, caused us to see some increase in yields? Well, a lot of data. I mean, this week in terms of economic uh, data has been pretty, pretty substantial. I uh, hear Jeff is pulling up the five day chart of the 10 year bond yield. As you know, I've many times I always say that the 10 year bond yield is your best benchmark for what's going on with mortgage rates. And unfortunately, as you can see here, going back from last Friday, when the 10-year bond yield was hovering around 4% or a little under, it definitely has climbed in the second half of sort of the mid to second half of this week. Of course, we're not done yet. We still have Friday. But you can see how at one point it jumped up all the way up to about 420. Um, more recently, it's settling in more like 418, as you can see there on the chart. Uh, and in fact, as a consequence, this is about the highest we've seen the 10-year uh, bond yield in almost a year. Uh, you may recall back in October of last year, the 10-year bond yield did get up to around 422. So we're we're testing those those highs at least over the past year. So in, in that regard, what is the uh, what's been going on in terms of economic data that has caused this kind of movement in bond yields? Well, lots and lots of it. Uh, this week, for example, Monday or actually on Tuesday, the first couple of data points that came out that had some effect on the market is the JOLTS report, that's Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. And as you can see, they're slightly down uh, from what was forecast, 9.58 million in job openings versus 9.6 uh, forecast. So that's a slow decline. The other thing that came out on Tuesday was the ISM manufacturing. ISM is uh, Institute of Supply Management. They do a survey in the manufacturing sec sector, and you can see that the number came out 46.4. Forecast was 46.8, so a little bit lower. Basically, anything under 50 is considered a weak market as, as it relates to manufacturing. 
And then yesterday, uh, the big market movers were two things. The ADP report, 324,000 new jobs versus only 175,000 forecast. That, again, jolted the bond market a little bit, showing very strong job numbers. I'll tell you, though, as I'll mention a little bit later, I don't like to follow uh, ADP too much. I think that the reliance on that number is a little bit overdone. But then the other item that came out yesterday that really, I think, shook up the bond markets, and rightly so, is Fitch, one of the major down uh, rating agencies for uh, credit, U.S. credit, downgraded the U.S. Uh, from their AAA rating to double uh, double A plus. Now, that's only a slight downgrade, but still, it's a factor. Um, and it's all a political issue, really. What it's really about is the fact that we continue to have some really significant deficit spending. The U.S. deficit is growing. Uh, Congress hasn't got together to come up with a long-term plan for budget and spending. And as a consequence, Fitch has sort of sent out uh, sort of a signal, if you will, that by downgrading the U.S. because of this sort of uh, log jam in terms of coming up with a long-term agreement. And they first alerted the markets about the potential of this downgrade back in May, a couple months ago, uh, almost three months ago. So this was not totally a surprise, but it definitely you know got the uh, bond yields going upward. And then today we had several different uh, data points that came out. Just today, for example, initial initial, initial jobless claims, uh, 227,000 was the number. Forecast was the same amount. Previous was 221, so slight increase. U.S. Product, productivity came out 3.7%, forecast to 2.3. Higher productivity is actually good. It indicates easing inflation. Uh, the S&P U.S. Services Purchasing Managed Managers Index, 52.3 versus 52.4, slight decline. The ISM Services Index, kind of like the manufacturing, also came in a little bit lower, so showing some decline in the services sector. And then factory orders, slightly higher at 2.3 uh, versus 2.2 forecast. And then for tomorrow, what we have coming are the non-farm payrolls. Now, remember, this is sort of the... Um, same number as the ADP number, but it's coming from the Labor Department, not from a private company. The forecast for non-farm payrolls is 200,000 new jobs. So we'll see if that ends up being more accurate. I think it will be. That's why I always say kind of dismiss ADP. Don't rely on that too much, even though the markets tend to do that. Um, so with that, um, what I really want to point out, of course, unemployment rates coming out tomorrow and then finally hourly wages. So lots and lots of data again, continuing to provide us somewhat of a mixed signal. I think once we get a little bit of settling down from this Fitch downgrade, and if these other uh, data points continue to signal some decline in activity and so forth, and most importantly, in reduction in inflation, I would suggest that these bond yields should settle down a little bit. We shouldn't really panic too much. We're still holding on to the sixes, although now we're in the high sixes instead of low. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic we won't be going much higher. Now, in that regard, I wanted to um, go on to uh, this next slide that Jeff pulled up. And I want to try to give you a little bit more perspective about mortgage rates in general. Now, this slide, this is actually uh, created by uh, Freddie Mac. And it represents uh, the history of mortgage rates going back to 1971, the spring of 71, when they were first being tracked up until now. And while you may not be able to see this real closely on the right side of this graph, that's the most recent years. In fact, right there at the very end is where we're at right now. <clears throat> and, um, and as you go backwards, one of the things you can start to notice here is that frankly, prior to uh, say year 2000, all the way back to 71, look how high these mortgage rate levels got to be. In fact, pretty much for that entire about 30 year, 29, 30 year period, mortgage rates, other than a slight dip in the mid 90s, mortgage rates have been as high as they are now or higher for almost that whole 30 year period. And it's only been since 2000 that we really started to see rates get under um, this 6%, 7% level. And of course, to the low in the, during the pandemic and back up to where we're at. So with this next slide, what I'm going to do is kind of dig into a little bit of the details of this history of mortgage rates chart um, and point out a few interesting uh, you know, facts about 
that movement in rates over that uh, over 50 years, about 54 years. And again, the chart was created or is maintained by Freddie Mac, and it shows April of 97 to or I'm sorry, April to 1971 to present as to the mortgage rate history. And as I pointed out, when you look at the uh, the period on that chart from 2012 to 2020, mortgage rates pretty much stayed between the mid threes to high fours. Prior to that, early 2000s, it was near 7% in 2001, got to a low of about mid threes in 2012, as I pointed out earlier. In the 1990s, that decade began with rates, mortgage rates near 10%. Now, they did dip slightly to mid sixes by you know, mid decade. In fact, um, yeah, it was about mid decade, 1994, 95. But we ended the 90s back up near 8%, again, higher than we are now. Uh, in the 1980s, um, that's the decade I got into the business in 1982, rates, mortgage rates started off below 12%. Uh, or low 12 percent, peaked at 18 and a half in December of 81 and then ended the decade, ended the 80s near 10 percent again. Um, so, again, all that that entire period of time, mortgage rates were considerably higher than they are right now. And then if you go back to the very beginning from the 1970s, um, you know, basically from the start of this chart, 71 up through the end of the decade, um, you know, during um, the mid sevens in April of 71, nearly got to 13% by the end of the decade. So the point of all this is that I know there's a tendency to be, you know, feeling despair and sad that rates, our mortgage rates are so high right now. But in reality, historically speaking, mortgage rates that we have right now are not, you know, crazy high. In fact, as I pointed out, for more than our 54 year history of these mortgage rates or 53 year history, of these mortgage rates, mortgage rates during a majority of that time were higher than they are now. So I just want folks to keep that in perspective. Uh, and this is why I you know, end this chart or this this slide with the beginning of a quote. And this is coming from me. And I've often said, you know, only in America will folks take and go, you know, take their credit card, go out and buy a $200 dinner on their 22% credit card and complain about a six and a half percent mortgage rate. So I hope that gives you some perspective about the fact that, you know, mortgage rates while have have gone up quite a bit from that low in the during the pandemic of 20 and 21. Historically speaking, they're not that crazy. They're actually fairly normal. Of course, we do need to see some adjustment in um, home prices to help make these higher rates more tolerable and more affordable. But other than that, mortgage rates have not gone crazy through the roof, as you might you know, might perceive. So hopefully that'll give you some encouragement as we continue to watch where mortgage rates go from here. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and I, I, I'm bringing this up only because um, I think it's a subject that, for one, I, I think it gets a little bit of a bad rap. And number two, I think it still has a lot of confusion around it. And that's the whole concept of PMI. And of course, somewhat humorously, I try to suggest that here with my title is PMI the devil. And the reason I say that is in talking to borrowers, prospective borrowers, I've, I've noticed throughout throughout all my years of doing this, PMI is just deemed to be a really bad thing, a really negative thing. And most borrowers try to avoid it. Um, it's almost in the same basket as folks who are afraid of a mortgage hard pull on their, you know, for their credit report is going to create this inquiry that's going to crater their credit scores, which I discussed recently. That doesn't happen. That's a that's an undue fear that most you know, consumers have. And I think PMI is somewhat in the same basket. PMI is actually a good thing and it provides a lot of benefits to borrowers. So I want to kind of break through that that belief that PMI is such a terrible thing that you should always try to avoid. So per, first of all, what in the heck is mortgage insurance all about? Well, it, it's not the same as the insurance you get on your house. Mortgage insurance lowers the risk to lenders who accept lower down payments from borrowers. Now, why why is that? You know, because most borrowers will say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to pay for the co for an insurance policy, essentially, that's going to benefit the lender and not me. Well, of course, they're not realizing there is a benefit to them as a borrower. But yes, there is a benefit to the lender. You know, prior to, you know, in the early days of mortgages going back during the Great Depression, a mortgage typically required a 20 percent down payment or more in a very short loan term. 
Well, the Roosevelt administration came up with the idea of getting the FHA to offer financing at much more extended uh, repayment terms up to 30 years with a much lower down payment. Now, in, in order to induce lenders to do that, they had to create the concept of mortgage insurance. So the mortgage insurance actually insures the lender in case the borrower defaults because they are putting very little money into the purchase of the home or into the loan. Um, so that's really how the whole concept of mortgage insurance came up. It was actually FHA mortgage insurance was the initial product, again, used to insure a lender and in case the bar were default. So the idea was because FHA allowed a three and a half percent down payment, which was unheard of in the lending community back in those days, the lenders were induced to make that loan under the promise that if they have a borrower who uh, defaulted because of a low down payment, couldn't handle monthly payments, they could then submit a uh, uh, submit a claim to FHA, actually to HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and get reimbursed for the foreclosure loss. So that's what triggered more lending and spurred more home building and spurred more home buying. Now, what is PMI as it relates to that? Well, PMI is an acronym for private mortgage insurance. So that's the important thing to distinguish. PMI is not the same as the mortgage insurance on an FHA loan, two different things. Why is it called PMI? Because PMI is used to insure loans that are not uh, guaranteed or insured by the federal government. So conventional conforming loans, yes, loans sold to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, even those, though, even though those are quasi governmental agencies, those loans are not insured or guaranteed by the federal government. Those are actually private companies. And so mortgage insurance used for non FHA mortgages, conventional conforming loan, uh, mortgages became known as private mortgage insurance. So that's the distinction. PMI is private used on conventional loans. The FHA mortgage insurance is only on FHA loans. Now, the amount of, you know, one of the big concerns about um, the uh, PMI is the cost, that it's going to be unduly costly to the borrower. And um, in addition, what does PMI actually do in terms of insuring the lender? Well, the PMI coverage is going to insure the lender by as much as 35% of the loan amount down to as little as 6% of the loan amount, depending on credit score and the loan to value. And then in terms of the, um, the premiums, there are two different types of, of premiums associated with PMI. One is LPMI or lender paid mortgage insurance. With this, there's a, a single lump sum financed into the rate and the premiums can range from 0.61 to as much as, believe it or not, 10%, depending on the loan to value and credit score. The other type of uh, PMI is BPMI or borrower paid mortgage insurance. With this uh, uh, insurance, the borrower pays a separate premium, an annual premium. They pay it monthly as part of their mortgage payment. Uh, now, the base premiums on this range from as little as 0 0.17, uh, 0.17 of the loan amount to as high as 1.86 of the loan amount. And then there's additional premium adjustments for various risk, risk factors. So I'm going to have Jeff pull up a rate card for PMI so you can get a better idea. Now, this is very small. You aren't re really able to read this. But the column on the left, that is a column that shows that the range of premiums that will be charged depending on down payment as little as three percent uh down payment down uh, increased or, or yet yeah, increased to 85 percent 15 percent down 85 percent loan to value and you can get a kind of an idea as how the premiums change for example if you're putting three percent down and your credit score is between 620 and 639 the premium for the pmi is quite high 1.86 percent but if you're a very high credit score borrower over 780 and you're putting 3% down, then the PMI premium only drops to 0.58. And so the point of this chart is you can see that the premiums will range depending on a various number of factors, credit score, down payment, and then also down at the bottom, there's additional adjustments for second homes, employee relocation homes, loans, manufacturing homes, et cetera. So understand that, yeah, that what goes into 
setting the premium for a PMI coverage is relatively com complex. Now, one of the things that has always been the case when it comes to PMI, I've seen it for years, is because it's deemed to be so awful and that you should try to avoid it at any cost, there's been a strategy that's been used in the industry for years to try to avoid PMI, even when you're putting a minimum down. And that concept involves something what we call a piggyback loan. Now, what is a piggyback loan? Well, I call it a PMI avoidance scheme, and that to some degree is true. Otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that. But the basic idea with a piggyback is to avoid PMI, you split up your financing. Let's say, for example, you only have 10% down, but you don't want PMI. You want to avoid that. Uh, well, what you would do is set up a, you'll get a first mortgage at 80% of the price of the home. You'll then get a second mortgage, usually a HELOC, for 10% of the price of the home. And then you put 10% down. Um, this is called an 80-10-10. And with that structure, there is no PMI. Why? Even though you're only putting 10% down, well, the reason is, is because the lender holding the first at 80%, that doesn't require PMI because PMI, by the way, is only triggered when the loan to value is above 80%. So with the 80-10-10 piggyback structure, because the first mortgage is only 80% of the value of the home or the price, there's no PMI triggered or required. Now, a second mortgage generally will have a higher rate than a first mortgage anyway. Those, as a rule, don't ever have PMI on them, have any kind of mortgage insurance on them. And so as a consequence, that second mortgage piece, usually a HELOC that, that's at 10% of the price of the home, that doesn't have PMI either. So this is a way you can avoid the cost of PMI by simply splitting up your total financing into two different loans, a first and a second. We can do 80 15 fives, we can do 80 10 tens, we can even do 85 15 fives. So there's a lot of different uh, ways to structure this. <clears throat> um, now, this is usually done because it's perceived to be the case that by doing a piggyback, you're going to end up with a lower housing expense than if you take the single bigger loan with a PMI premium added to it. So let me give an example to show you how that's not really the case anymore, at least not right now. <clears throat> so consider a home purchase for $600,000 and 90% loan to value and a credit score of seven sixty. dollars Now, if we use a HELOC, uh, as part of a piggyback, we're going to have an 80-10-10. Again, 80-10-10, 10% down, 10% second, 80% first. Well, that 80% first and 10% second, that also equals 90% combined loan to value. Now, when you do it this way, and I did this yesterday using mark, current market rates, the monthly housing expense for a piggyback loan, counting both the first mortgage and the, and the HELOC, would be $3,996. And this, by the way, assumes that the payment on the HELOC is only required to be interest only. So that means that 10% HELOC portion, the minimum payment you're making doesn't even pay down the principal, it's simply paying the interest. But even with that, plus the principal and interest payment on the first, the total housing expense, $39.96, excluding taxes and homeowners insurance. Now, compare that to the other alternative, get a 90% loan, no, sing, no second mortgage. You're not doing an 80-10-10. You're going to get a first mortgage at 90% of $600,000 with borrower paid mortgage insurance. Now, when you take that approach, the monthly housing expense is $37.58. And that includes, by the way, the PMI premium under this scenario at $99. And by the way, I'm using the you know best credit score possible, 760 plus. So as a consequence, what this shows is that the housing expense is actually lower by $238 by getting a single loan at 90% with the borrower paid mortgage insurance rather than trying to avoid that PMI by going the route of an 80-10-10. So as a consequence, what I want you to realize, this is a good example of why PMI is not, you know, is not something to avoid. It's not something that just costs too much and doesn't provide you a benefit. In fact, it does the opposite. It allows you to put more money, uh, put less money down. And in most cases, if you have a decent or good credit score, the amount of the premium is going to be reasonable as it relates to what the housing expense would cost if you went the other route and did a piggyback. And then the my, I guess, most favorite part of the PMI option 
is understanding that PMI, specifically borrower paid MI, not lender paid MI, but borrower paid MI is cancelable in the future. Now, we're going to cover that in an upcoming show where I'm going to get into details about how you can cancel your PMI. But just understand that that is a sort of a subtle benefit of PMI. And you should always keep that in mind if you're faced with how to finance a, a purchase where you're putting less than 20 percent down and deciding whether to get a single loan with PMI or go the piggyback route. So hopefully that helps and clears up uh, some of the confusion as it relates to PMI. Trust me, folks, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. I would encourage you to not avoid PMI because in the long run, I think it's going to be better off for you. OK, with that, I want to go ahead and get into the closing question for last week. Um, now, some of you may know this fairly well, but again, I just had a, a prospective home buyer uh, ask me about uh you know, this question last uh, recently. And so I wanted to add it to the program. So here's the question again. What are the benefits of setting up a biweekly payment schedule for a new mortgage? And is it possible to achieve the same result without setting up biweekly bi payments with your loan servicer? Well, a uh, couple of questions there. So let me give you jump right into the answers. The reason people will do or ask about a biweekly payment term is because it's going to shorten your payoff term. Now, on average, depending on interest rates and so forth, the amount of reduction in your loan term is generally going to be somewhere around five and a half to seven years. So how is that done? Well, it's actually done or achieved by paying extra principal during the entire year. Uh, so let me give you an example exactly how this works. What you would do is first determine what your principal and interest payment is going to be for the loan that you have. Take that principal and interest amount that's going to be paid, you know, monthly, 12 times, divide it by two. With a biweekly mortgage payment schedule, what that means is you're going to take half that principal and interest payment and you're going to pay it every two weeks, like every other Friday, for example. Well, if you think about it, if you take half your monthly payment divided by two and then pay that half amount every other week, that means you're going to pay a total of 26 installments of that half of your PNI payment. Well, 26 installments, if you think about it, there's 52 weeks in a year. So as a consequence, over 12 months, you've actually made 13 of your required monthly mortgage payments. Half that mortgage payment times 26, and then you divide that by two, it's actually 13 monthly payments is what you've done. So you've actually paid an extra monthly payment over that uh, course of that 12 months by simply taking your regular payment, dividing it by two every two weeks, 26 times, you end up having made 13 monthly payments. Now, the issue with this is that in getting asking your lender to set up biweekly payments, you could have some fees involved. Not always, but you could. There can be uh, some fe uh, fees charged just to set up the biweekly payment schedule. And sometimes it can be a few hundred bucks. And then they may even charge you some fees per installment. You know, consider it like a convenience fee you, you uh, pay when you're buying uh, sports tickets or something. Um, so you can face setup fees and small nominal recurring uh, fees with each installment because this is a schedule of making payments that's more laborious to the, to the servicer. It it's a little more work involved for them to accommodate this kind of payment schedule. So how do you achieve the same result without incurring these fees and you know waiting for your servicer to set it up? Well, the way you do that, take your same principal and interest payment, divide it by 12. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take that 1 12th amount of your regular monthly payment, add that to your regular monthly payment as additional principal. So again, you'll take your monthly uh, monthly principal and interest payment, you'll pay that, but add to it one twelfth of that payment as additional principal. And of course, when you do that, you're not going to incur any fees at all for you know doing this yourself essentially. And by doing this yourself, guess what? You achieve a similar reduction in your payment term, your your repayment term. You're going to lower that term by probably again somewhere between five and a half to seven years and without having to contact your servicer or pay any fees to set it up. So a little trick of the trade, 
keep that in mind. If you're thinking about a biweekly payment, you're trying to figure out ways how to accelerate paying down your loan balance, shorten that, that 30 year term to you know, 23, 24. This is an effective way to do it. And you can do it all on your own. So with that, I want to go ahead and um, go to our closing question for next week. And I, I'm, I'm posing this one in part because you know, interest rates are kind of a big topic this week, all the volatility in the market, all the economic data points that came out. And of course, we recently had the Fed meeting. So here's the cl closing question for next week. The Fed raised interest rates by 0.25% on July 26, 2023. That means mortgage rates, mortgage rates increased by 0.25% as well, correct? Well, uh, you'll be interested to get that answer next week, I'm sure. And I think you'll, you're going to be a little bit surprised by my answer. But again, this is for next week. So tune in at that time where I'll give you the answer and it'll be on the house. Jeff, back to you. Hey, Art, I uh, just have one question uh, that came in. And the question was uh, the whole uh, PMI thing is, yes, if I go ahead and take the PMI, I'm saving $238 based on your example. But if I went the other way and did an 80-10-10 and I had an interest only loan at the end of that period, I still have I still have a big chunk of money that I have to pay back versus if I would have just accepted the front end and not only experienced lower payments, but now no surprise or, or big debt at the end, which is that 10-10. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. There, there's really two points about the 80-10-10 uh, the as it relates to using a HELOC, which again is the most popular second mortgage product used for these piggyback loans to avoid PMI. The one big issue is the HELOCs generally, their required monthly payment is interest only. So for that piece of the total financing, you know that that portion that's part of that thirty nine ninety six monthly payment in my example, um, you're not paying down the balance on that HELOC at all. Mm -hmm. So when I point out that the ninety percent loan with PMI coverage, even with the PMI premium included, is two hundred and thirty eight dollars a month less, well, in reality, if you think about it, the benefit is actually more than 238 less. Why? Because with the 80-10-10, that higher monthly payment doesn't include paying down any of the principal on the HELOC portion. Yeah. So if you accounted for that, then in reality, the difference between the two scenarios uh, is greater than 238 a month. When, if you take into account, what if you took that 80-10-10 and, and did pay down some uh, principal toward the HELOC, that means your actual cash expenditures even higher with the 801010 versus the single loan with PMI. And then to the extreme, if you go on for 10 years and you've never paid down that HELOC and you still have it, then that balance for the HELOC then gets amortized for 20 years until it's paid off. And then that payment jumps up even higher. So that's another reason why these piggybacks, while in the old days, if you will, were a very popular way to avoid PMI, they don't work quite as well. Uh, as they used to. And that's why I really try to encourage people don't have a closed mind about PMI. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, that's great clarity because it's uh, it's like, hey, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. In this case, paying now is uh, is really a better play. Just go ahead and pay that PMI. The other piece I had uh, is a question was this, as you said, the uh, BPMI is cancelable in the future. Yep. Can, can the value of a home going up also trigger an opportunity to cancel that? Or is it only when you lower the balance against your original mortgage? Well, it's actually both. And again, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have a segment uh, on the upcoming program here, probably in the next week or two to get into the details about canceling MI. But mm. uh, because there are some differences, both with regard to PMI versus FHA mortgage insurance. So I, I definitely want to get into that in a you know future program. But what I'll say now is that yeah, in order to cancel the borrower paid MI, again, that's the borrower paid PMI. Um, that is possible. There are certain conditions involved. A big part of it has to do with establishing how much equity you have in the home at the time you're requesting the PMI to be canceled. And that equity can be achieved by paying down your balance, increase in market value, mm -hmm. or both. Um, so that is what provides you the opportunity to cancel PMI uh, in the future. It's just a question of how soon can you do that? 
and what is the criteria required in order to successfully get that done. That's what I'll be covering here soon in, in an upcoming episode. So that's great. That's great. Thank you, Art. Hey, on the screen, you have information. Get a hold of Art. It's at uh, Mortgage Works, 760 883 5700, or you can always contact him directly on the hotline, his cell phone at 714 612 9035. Of course, you can go to the website, take a look at that rate chart, and uh, you know, go ahead and click that button about, about rates, and he'll it, it explains more of how that all comes together. And of course, you can send Art an email at art at mwloan.com. You know, here's the thing we've all heard that saying, hey, if you go into a dark alley, who do you want to go in with? Do you want to go into somebody that uh, if you think of martial arts, hey, they just got that white belt? Or do you want to go in with a guy who has a black belt on and he's got a bunch of stripes on him? Maybe he's a ninth degree black belt. I'll take the ninth degree black belt. Well, that's what Art is. He is a ninth degree black belt when it comes to mortgages and <laughs> you know strategies and how to help you achieve more, maybe with less. And in this case, he showed it today with, hey, should I avoid PMI by doing this uh, piggyback loan or should I do it the, the way and say, hey, let me just put this loan uh, with uh, mortgage insurance on there? I actually end up saving money. So if you have those questions come around, remember, who do you want to go into a mortgage with? Somebody who's brand new? Maybe they only have, maybe they have a green belt, but they're not a black belt. You want to get hold of Art, and his number is 714-612-9035. Art, any last thoughts before we let you go back to battle? Well, no, I just realized that I got to make sure I bring my black belt to next week's show. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to make a note to do that. So. I love it. Well, hey, have a great week, everybody. Again, remember, if you have questions over any of this and you want to have a comment, put a comment in there, just put them in the comment section, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube and Art will get back with you. And better yet, give him a call because you know what they say about Mortgage Works. I'll let Art fill that in. Well, thanks, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening and watching. Uh, stay tuned next week for another edition of Mortgage Minute. And remember, um, I'm Art Alvarez. I'm with Mortgage Works. And we do have the answers and they're on the house. Take care.